Welcome to everybody to the FMM conference, the 24th annual conference. Um, good afternoon if you're in in Europe, and good morning across the Atlantic, and good evening, I guess, if you're in, in Asia. I will give the floor to the director of the IMK, Sebastian Dolin, to make the opening address. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, Welcome to the 24th Annual Conference of the Forum for Macroeconomics and Macroeconomic Policies, the FMM. For the first time in almost a quarter century of the existence of the network, this year we are not meeting physically in Berlin. We are meeting in the virtual event room of BlueJeans, the video conferencing software we are using. And, um, well, this, this is new for us. We have not had such a large event with such a geographical spread. Uh, online, so I hope everything uh, is working smoothly. Um, the decision to move the FMM conference to a virtual format has been both very easy and very difficult for us. It has been very easy, and it has been very or quite clear for a while that we would not be able to travel internationally, and especially not intercontinentally in the fall. So we, we have planned from, from the summer onwards to have this in a, um, in a, in a digital format. Um, the FMM conferences in the past have always benefited from the large international outreach and the participation of uh, academics from across the world. And it was clear that we would not have that. The decision to move to a completely virtual format was easy, as the main strength of the FMM conference would not have materialized. And uh, we thought it would be very sad to have this conference with only like 50 or 70 Germans uh, in, in a hotel in Berlin. And given the, the, the recent development of infections here, uh, probably even that would not have been possible. However, at the same time when we made this decision, um, it was very hard for us because diversity and this international outreach of the conference is the reason why um, people come to the FMM conference. It has always been this forum where once a year you meet colleagues from heterodox macroeconomics from all over Europe and increasingly from all over the world. The conference has always been deliberately designed with very long coffee and lunch breaks and large dinners to which everyone is invited to mix and mingle and to talk, all these things uh, which, which are not allowed in the pandemic. So in many respects, these informal contacts of the typical FMM conference in a usual year might be as important as the content of the presentations. And moving to a virtual event meant that these interactions could not take place this year. And um, of course, that, that made this decision hard. Another aspect has been the size. As far as I see, most academic conferences having moved online have been much smaller than their real-world equivalents, at least when it comes to the number of presentations. The number of um, the, or, um, the audience often has been larger. This is also true for the FMM. While in the past years we had easily 150 presentations during the three days of the FMM conference, um, this time we have only about 25. This is especially at the expense of the traditional parallel sessions in which researchers at all stages of their career usually have the opportunity to present their research. And all this is the reason that while we, of course, hope and are confident that this online conference runs smoothly, we will have great discussions even online. We remain very committed to have an on-site conference again next year in the fall. Of course, this cannot be a promise at that point in time. The COVID crisis drags on longer, and international travel will still not be possible next year. We might have to take another difficult decision. But if the situation has improved, by next summer, we will move mainly offline again. Of course, uh, with the usual streaming services uh, we have already offered in the past, so that those who cannot make it or those who do not well want to make it for environmental reasons can listen and join online. We also remain committed to organize our traditional FMM summer school next year. Again, we have not moved to the concrete planning phase as the infection developments here are so uncertain that we will keep you all informed. From a content perspective, the corona crisis is a situation which, as, as, as ironic as it sounds, which is an ideal opportunity to be covered by an FMM conference. Heterodox macroeconomics, and especially its post-Keynesian variety, um, as it has been pursued at our annual conferences, is based on the promise that the economy, economy very often needs government interventions to reach full employment or other socially valuable goals, such as the eradication of poverty or 
climate neutrality. In this respect, times of high crisis are high times for post-Keynesian economics. In fact, since 2009, six out of our 11 annual conferences had the word crisis in their title, and so does this year's conference. And in fact, if we look back at the programs of the past years and also in today's um, program, many of the topics and questions which are now discussed on a policy level have long been covered by presentations of past FMM conferences. So, for example, the key question has always been how can we stabilize an economy in a deep crisis? And of course, there's discussion is this now mainly a supply crisis or is there a demand side effect? Um, these are issues which we have discussed already in the past. How important are budget constraints when it comes to stabilization policies? Can the government or the government together with the central bank, can they do whatever it takes to save an economy or are there limits to it? What are the risks of very expansionary monetary and fiscal policy? This is something which we have also uh, very, well, I would uh, say strongly disputed and discussed at these conferences. And um, as, as always, uh, there, there's the, the, the big question of uh, how, how far can we, can we push that? How much truth, for example, is in modern monetary theory? And where are limits to, to what, what, they, what they demand and what they say? what the proponents say. Well, how can inequality be tackled or at least limited when a crisis hits the economy? Again, that is something which we have discussed in the, uh, in the crisis of 2008-2009, what we have discussed in the Euro crisis, and what we will discuss this week again. Another question is, and again, that goes back to 2008-2009, how can we construct green stimulus or green recovery packages? What can we do in order to combine full employment with uh, an economy which doesn't um, destroy uh, the, the planet and which, which basically lives within the planetary boundaries. And finally, and again, that's something we have discussed over the past 10 years, but which is again on top of the agenda, has globalization passed its peak? The problems we have seen with supply chains in the COVID crisis, does that mean that there will be a deglobalization in the coming years? And around these topics, the Conference Selection Committee this year has managed to put together a highly interesting program, running each of the coming three days from 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. Berlin times, and uh, there will always be three blocks of two hours each day, with 30 minutes breaks in between. We will publish the papers as usual in a Papers and Proceedings issue of the European Journal of Economics and Economic Policies, short Egypt. And moreover, I would like to draw your attention to our FMM working paper series. Since we started that series about three years ago, we have now 60 papers in the series, and the numbers, number of questions which are covered here at this conference are also covered in the contributions there. Before we start with the first plenary session, I would like to point out that as every year, the conference is financed by the Hans Böckler Foundation, on behalf of which I'm actually speaking here. Um, because the Macroeconomic Policy Institute, of which I'm the director, is part of the Hans Böckler Foundation. Special thanks at this point goes not only to the conference organizing committee, but of course again to our great conference organizing team from the Macroeconomic Policy Institute and the Hans Böckler Foundation, which have made and will make sure over the coming days that everything runs smoothly. There's Sabine Nemitz, Svenja Berger, Jennifer Büsen, Katharina Jacobi is the main ones responsible, and um, of course our student assistant, Premiers Neuenberger. So thank you very much for, well, I cannot say coming this time, but thank you very much for joining us, and I wish you all a thought-provoking conference on macroeconomic policy implications and policy reactions of the COVID crisis. Let it be one of the nice and shining moments in these not-so-happy times. Thanks. So thank you very much, uh, Sebastian uh, Dulin, uh, for that introduction. Uh, yes, this is one of the things we need to get uh, used to at our normal conference. Of course, there would be a round of applause after the, uh, the introduction. That's not possible under these uh, conditions. So we'll move uh, uh, straight on to the to the first session, and I'm happy to chair that session. My name is Wart. I'm also at the IMK, the Macroeconomic Policy Institute responsible here for European um, economic uh, policy. And again, I'd like to welcome 
you all wherever you're joining us, whether you're a registered participant or whether you're following us on uh, on the live stream. So the title of this first session is the recovery and transformation in the European Union, how and what to, to finance. Now, uh, European macroeconomic policy issues and debates have been a regular feature of FMM conferences over the years. Um, now, the COVID crisis that Sebastian mentioned, uh, which is the sort of linchpin that holds the, the nine panels this year together, has led to an acceleration of reform initiatives, also policy debates in Europe regarding macroeconomic um, policies. On top of that have come, you know, perceptions of an increasing urgency of the need to decarbonize our economies. And these two um, forces, if you like, have uh, led to a questioning of certain orthodoxies, um, Previously, things that were previously regarded as red lines have now been maybe already crossed or are now uh, up for debate. I give us an example the, the suspension of the fiscal rules and the plans now under next generation EU to borrow in the name of the European Union three quarters of a trillion or up to three quarters of a trillion euros um, and distribute these funds to, to member states. So there's a a lot has been going on over a, a very short period of time, and the the aim of this panel is to is to analyze those those recent developments, particularly then to look ahead at the challenges to come, and and see what's maybe also missing, what still needs to be done. And I'm I'm really pleased that we've got such three such uh, prominent and and well recognized experts in the field. And I'm going to give the floor uh, in a minute now to to our first speaker, Jean Pierre Vidal. Um, he's the chief economic advisor to uh, Charles Michel, the president of the European uh, Council. Our second speaker, uh, and she will be focusing on the on the, the revenue side, is Margit Schwarzenstaller from VIFO, the Austrian Institute of Economic Research. Our third speaker, who will focus more on the expenditure side, um, is Francesco uh, Saranceno from OFCE, uh, the French Economics Observatory in in Paris. So the, the format is the following. Each speaker will have 20 minutes. Uh, we want to be as uh, interactive as possible. Today as possible, this is the first time we've put on such a large event uh, in this electronic uh, format. Um, uh, we want to uh, you know, try and in, uh, get you also to intervene. If you're a registered attendee, intervene um, personally. But we'll have to see how that functions. So this is the plan. Um, please use the chat function. Please um, indicate that you would like to ask a question and um, either write your question in the chat function um, or at least indicate the, the thrust of your question and then uh, raise your hand by clicking on the appropriate button, which I believe is on the right hand side of your screen, um, so that we can uh, try and give you the floor. And if, if that works well, we will we will get you to, to intervene personally. If we see there are some technical issues there, then we will use the chat function and I will pass on your questions to the to the three uh, to the three speakers. Um, so that's what I wanted to say by way of introduction. I'd now like to give the floor to uh, the first speaker, uh, Jean-Pierre Vidal. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to talk at this 24th conference of the Forum for Macroeconomics and Macroeconomic Policies. I look at the program of last year. Your 23rd conference was about the 20th anniversary of the euro and macroeconomic challenges. So, in fact, I mean, if I had been invited last year, I could have drawn lessons from 20 years of monetary union and highlight the upcoming macroeconomic challenges, but more, I would say, from a theoretical and, post and, and uh, theoretical perspective, in a sense. This year, my remarks are on the European Union's economic response to the crisis, to the COVID-19 crisis. And I do speak why the virus is still spreading in our streets and there is still significant uh, uncertainty about the economic and social implications of, uh, of this crisis. So we are in times of uncertainty, and in times of uncertainty, what is really essential 
is for leaders to set out strategic orientations and thereby to reduce policy uncertainty. And this is really what European leaders achieved this year by agreeing on the European budget and the 750 billion recovery fund. So in my remarks today, I think I will convey two main messages to you. The first one is that the lessons from the sovereign debt crisis have been learned, and this has led this time to a prompt and creative policy response. The second message is that these recovery plans, by design, reconcile the long-term structural objectives of the Union with the short-term yet imperative need for macroeconomic stabilization. So, first message. The lessons from the sovereign debt crisis have been learned. We know all very well that the European Union was very much criticized for its policy response to the sovereign debt crisis. I mean, then we were criticized for being too slow, for providing too little, and being late, or too late. By contrast, this crisis led to an immediate, effective, and commensurate monetary and fiscal policy response to address the socio-economic consequences of the pandemic. First, at the level of all member states. Of course, they are first in line when it comes to fiscal policy. But, second, at the level of all European institutions. The monetary policy response with the ECB Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program came first, and that's normal, because this is their institution that, in a sense, in Europe has most executive power as far as macroeconomic policy is concerned. But all European institutions reacted, and they all reacted in a proactive and creative mood. So, for example, this initially led to the three safety nets that were developed by the Eurogroup. First, the sure mechanism that was proposed by the European Commission to support, let's say, court schemes in member states. So that was a safety net for workers. Second, the Pan-EU Guarantee Fund that was proposed by the European Investment Bank and created a safety net for businesses. And third, the pandemic crisis support credit line that was proposed by the European Stability Mechanism. And let me stress that this institution is born from the, the previous uh, crisis, from the sovereign debt crisis. And this was a safety net for your area sovereigns. These three safety nets were very important uh, to be at the beginning of the crisis and were developed very early on uh, in this crisis. And they were actually stepping stones to the agreement on the recovery fund that was agreed in July together with the multi-annual financial framework which is our uh, European budget over seven years. What is important to, to stress is that the design of the, Euro, of the European policy response was driven by EU leaders themselves in the European Council. The President of the European Council, Charles Michel, convened four European Council video conferences before the Commission proposal. The European Council set the guidelines mandating the Commission to prepare an exceptional recovery instrument. And the deal, this deal, requires one additional video conference before the four days and four nights European Council meeting in July. I do believe that this historic deal is a remarkable achievement for the European Union. It contributes to support economies in the short term while paving the way towards an ambitious transformative agenda in line with the deal in line with the Green Deal and the digital transition uh, that uh, was also agreed by the European Council. My second message, the recovery plan indeed reconciles long-term structural objectives with the imperative need for macroeconomic stabilization. As you know, the European Union has two main ambitions for the next three decades. First, the ambition to become the first carbon neutral economy by 2050. So this is what we call the Green Deal, and this was endorsed by the December, at the December European Council last year. And second, to become more digital with the digital transition. Of course, this transformative agenda will lead to important, very significant structural changes in our economy. When you consider the European budget, the European budget is not the same sort of budget uh, 
that the member states have. It is really an investment budget. It operates transfers across countries through grants, and it was therefore the perfect instrument to promote structural changes in our economies. Of course, the European budget is not designed to cushion, to cushion symmetric shocks. It is not designed for fiscal stabilization. In Europe, we know that fiscal policy is a competence of member states. It's subject to fiscal rules and budgetary surveillance. And it is also clear that the EU budget, with its 1% of GNI size, is relatively small compared to national budget. If you, call, you know, just to, to give her, uh, let's say, some perspective on this, I mean, the, the European budget is 1% of GNI, but when you look simply in Europe today uh, at the impact of national budgets in terms of fiscal stabilization, let's just take a, a simple number. The response of national governments is really massive. This year, public expenditure in the European Union will increase from close to 47% of GDP to close to 55% of GDP. And this does provide, of course, I mean, macroeconomic stabilization on the expenditure side. But what was very important in the process that led to the recovery, the agreement to the recovery fund was that leaders um, identify very early on a key macroeconomic issue. And all the video conferences that took place in March, April, May were very important steps to reaching a common understanding there. And this issue was indeed the risk of a crisis of crisis driven economic divergence in the Union. The concern was simply that not all member states had the same capacity to, to respond to this common shock. And there were therefore two clear risks that were identified. First, there was a risk to the integrity of the single market and possibly, I mean, the development of all unlevel playing fields related to the different capacity or the different capacity that member states had to support businesses. And second, there was a risk to the integrity of the Eurozone through possible adverse sovereign debt market developments. The response that was provided by the Union, this very significant European policy response, has prevented sovereign debt market turbulences through the crisis. The recovery fund as such is two-pronged. On one hand, it financially supports member states that are, as I, I repeat, on the first line when it comes to fiscal stabilization. So it provides them room to, to, to deliver fiscal stabilization. And on this other end, it supports a transformative agenda. As you know, 30% of the funds under the multiannual financial framework and next generation EU will be devoted to the green objective. And this was agreed at the first and second October European Council, 20% of the fund under next generation EU will be devoted to the digital objectives. So this brings me to my final remark. The crisis obviously is not over. The virus is still spreading in our street as we speak and tomorrow evening, the European Council President will chair a video conference with European leaders on COVID-19. Yet, so far the European Union has reacted promptly and decisively to the social economic consequences of this crisis. And I will conclude on that and just uh, because as economists we like, we like to use counterfactuals, just make this thought experiment. What would be the situation of European financial markets today had European leaders not acted timely and decisively to the socio-economic consequences of the COVID-19 crisis? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre Vidal. A great kickoff to our uh, conference to get this and the session to get this uh, background as well from the from the institutional uh, side. Uh, I encourage the uh, attendees uh, already. Maybe if you have questions specifically to what uh, Jean-Pierre said, maybe to write them already in the chat. Um, and now I give the floor to the second presenter, uh, Margit Schatzenstadt. So thank you very much for having me here on this most timely uh, and, of course, very interesting panel um, in this unusual and extraordinary uh, format. Let me start with just a few words on the background and context in which the recent debate and proposals for innovative resources 
uh, to finance EU activities are uh, embedded. This, this debate is by far not new. Quite on the contrary, uh, there exists a long-standing decade-old debate about reforms in the system of own resources, considering the various structural deficits of the current financing system uh, for the MFF. Um, the recent economic crisis all over Europe caused by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has provided new impulses to this decade-old uh, debate, simply because there is the need um, to repay the debt incurred to finance the recovery and resilience fund under next generation um, EU. And the recent emergence of potential innovative own resources with an intrinsically pan-European uh, character is another um, development um, providing inspiration um, to deliberations uh, concerning innovative financial um, sources that may fund EU activities. Um, let's briefly look at the current structure of EU own resources. You see here that the EU budget primarily depends on contributions by member states, um, that is uh, VAT and GNI based on resources. These account for altogether over three fourths of overall revenues. Um, traditional owned resources, um, custom duties, sugar and agricultural levies have been greatly losing in importance uh, over the last uh, decades. Their share in overall owned resources went down from about two thirds in the mid 1970s to a bit more than 10 percent. Thus, EU expenditures are to a large and increasing uh, degree financed by member states contributions out of the general um, tax revenues. Um, this revenue structure has advantages and disadvantages. On the one hand, the current system of own resources provides a stable and reliable financial basis for the EU budget. Um, it delivers a more or less fair distribution of the financial burden, um, and it leaves the freedom of choice for member states with regard to the sources um, for their national contributions to finance the EU budget, um, according to the subsidiary principle. But there are also various shortcomings associated with the, associated the current own resource uh, the system. It leads to a decreasing and very low financial autonomy of the EU. Um, that the EU budget is mainly financed uh, by direct contributions from member states is the root cause um, of the so-called Tour debate. Uh, that means the focus of member states on net positions instead of a European value added provided by the EU budget. And last but by far not least, uh, the system of own resources as it is now does not contribute at all to central um, European objectives. Um, the current system of own resources does not contribute um, to the overarching goal uh, of sustainable growth and development in um, uh, the EU. And to further important EU policies, a fundamental reform could be part of a comprehensive reform of the MFF to increase European added value uh, of EU expenditures uh, and EU revenues. More concretely, partially replacing current owned resources by innovative and inter alia green uh, owned resources would create space for a reduction of member states' tax burdens, uh, particularly with regard to the high taxes on labor, uh, within a reform approach um, that may be labeled as supranational sustainability enhancing tax uh, shift encompassing the EU as well as the member states uh, level. Innovative own resources basically would not necessarily uh, have to be new in the sense of additional, but rather better own resources compared to the current ones. Candidates for such innovative own resources are taxes or levies that cannot be enforced in fact effectively on member state level due to tax competition, due to tax avoidance, due to tax uh, to, to cross-border externalities, etc., or which by their very nature uh, cannot be levied uh, by individual member states, and which contribute to European strategies and policies, um, in particular um, climate protection, the circular economy, fair taxation, um, stable uh, financial markets, um, etc. Um, as a high-level group on uh, own resources chaired by Mario Monti in its final report issued in uh, the end of um, 2016 pointed out a basket solution would be preferable. Um, that means green uh, own resources 
should be implemented together with other innovative own resources so that potential negative effects of specific own resources for individual countries could cancel out to a certain um, extent. Now, let's have a very brief look um, at recent developments in this debate. Uh, the proposals uh, by the European Commission from May 2018 included first steps to innovative own resources uh, to finance uh, the MFF 2021 to 2027. Uh, accordingly, innovative own resources should yield 12% uh, of overall revenues by 2027, uh, thus reducing the share of national contributions from above 80% to 71%. And these own resources should make a contribution to EU priorities, climate protection, circular economy, um, and fair uh, taxation uh, in particular. Um, several potential innovative own resources to finance the MFF will put forward um, a share of 3% in a CCCTB, um, common consolidated corporate tax base, including the digital sector, uh, which should yield about 12 billion uh, euros um, in revenues a share of 20% in the revenues from auctioning of ETS certificates um, to yield 3 billion euro per year, um, and a plastic-based own resource, which should yield about 7 uh, billion euro per year. Altogether, um, total revenues should reach about 22 billion uh, euro annually. Exactly two years later came the proposal by the European Commission from May 2020 for innovative own resources to finance the recovery and uh, resilience facility is all, as you all know, probably at the core of the um, recovery and resilience facility um, is the issuance of bonds on financial markets on behalf of the EU up to 750 billion uh, euro. And repayment is planned to start up to 2027 uh, 20, uh, and by 2058 at the latest and to facilitate Repayment, um, the European Commission uh, proposes the introduction of additional own resources on top of those proposed in May 2018 uh, at a later stage uh, of the 2021 to 2027 financial period. These are the options uh, proposed by the European uh, Commission. Uh, the first one is an ETS-based uh, own resource, including um, a possible extension to maritime and aviation uh, uh, sectors. Uh, the second one is an own resource based on the operation of companies drawing benefits from the EU single market. A third one is a carbon border adjustment mechanism. And a fourth one is um, digital tax on companies with global uh, with a global annual turnover uh, above uh, 750 million euros um, without uh, any sort of specification, actually. Um, so altogether, these options were expected to yield about 26 to 35 a billion euro uh, per year. The European Council conclusions um, of July 2020 only slightly differ from the uh, European Commission's proposals issued in May. Accordingly, as innovative own resource for the MFF, um, the introduction of a plastic-based own resource uh, in 2021 is envisaged. Uh, and then the, uh, the European Council conclusions include several innovative own resources to finance the recovery and resilience facility. Uh, the European Commission is asked to submit proposals on a border carbon adjustment mechanisms and a digital level in the first semester of 2021 with a view to their introduction by 2023 at the latest. Moreover, the European Commission is to put forward a proposal for a revised ETS scheme, which may be extended to aviation and maritime, to the aviation and maritime sector. The Union should also consider other own resources, including a financial transaction tax, uh, but only during the next uh, MFF period. And revenue should be used to enable an um, early repayment of next uh, generation EU that concretely the proceeds of the new own resources introduced after 2021 will be used for the early repayment of next generation EU borrowing. In a project within um, the EU's Horizon 2020 uh, research program called Fairtex, we elaborated a number of sustainability-oriented evaluation criteria for innovative tax-based own resources. These are growth friendliness, sufficiency, um, the impact on the personal distribution of income and wealth, environmental sustainability, revenue, 
uh, stability, um, non-attributability of revenues to individual member states, um, a fair national uh, distribution of the financial burden, um, fiscal integration, non-enforceability um, of uh, the respective levy at member state level, non-interference uh, with member states' tax systems, and visibility of a potential own resource. And we evaluated several options for sustainability-oriented own resources and estimated their potential revenues, in particular uh, a carbon-based flight ticket tax, a border carbon adjustment mechanism for the EU uh, ETS, a surcharge on national fuel taxes, a net wealth tax, a financial transaction tax, and a CCCTB based own uh, resource. Um, several of these options are green own resources that have been discussed or proposed in several contexts and by several proponents uh, in the past already. Also, the financial transaction tax and the CCCTB based own um, resource are old. Uh, acquaintances. Um, you see here on the table that the revenue potential of our candidates uh, varies widely, uh, ranging from 4 billion euro to 156 uh, billion euro um, annually. Um, to illustrate their potential contribution to financing um, the MFF, we simply related potential revenues to the EU budget's volume. Uh, for 2021, according to the uh, Commission's uh, 2018 proposal. Uh, and you see here that um, an FTT based on conservative assumptions, a carbon-based flight ticket tax, and a share of 1% of a CCCTP would not be able to deliver a substantial contribution um, to uh, EU revenues. However, a financial transaction tax uh, estimated under less conservative assumptions, a uh, net wealth tax, uh, uh, border carbon adjustment mechanism and a surcharge on national fuel taxes could substitute uh, significant shares of current own resources. Of specific interest, considering uh, the EU Green Deal and the EU's climate targets are options for green own resources. And uh, I think there are several options that are worth uh, discussing. The first one is uh, the option of a plastic-based uh, contribution um, of um, 80 cents per kilo non-recycled plastic packaging waste as proposed already by the Commission in May 2018. Um, also a share in the revenues from auctioning emission trading certificates um, is an interesting option, as well as a border carbon adjustment mechanisms and some um, way to price carbon emissions uh, of aviation. So let's let me just elaborate a bit further in detail on these four options for green own resources. Um, a plastic based contribution uh, appears as a quite obvious candidate for our own resources due to the cross border nature of plastic waste and fossil fuel use um, that's necessary to produce plastic. Um, it could curb plastic production and consumption, thus supporting the circular economy and thus decreasing carbon emissions. Um, its introduction uh, should be possible without treaty changes. Um, the incentive effects would depend on the concrete implementation in individual member states, um, namely whether it would be paid out of the general budget or whether it would be passed on to consumers via a new national levy. Um, I think that only in the latter case, the plastic-based own resource could really exert incentives to avoid plastic packaging um, waste. Also, a share um, of revenues from auctioning ETS certificates is an obvious candidate uh, for own resources, uh, stemming from an EU wide carbon uh, pricing mechanism and also due to the cross border nature of carbon emission. Also, um, uh, the uh, introduction uh, of this own resource should be possible without treaty changes and uh, revenues from uh, ETS certificates. Uh, seem to be um, a genuine pan-European um, resource with a considerable revenue potential. Um, there is a potential drawback, however, namely a potential conflict between member states and the EU about the revenues uh, which currently go into uh, member states' budgets. Um, this conflict could, however, be avoided by gradually shifting 
uh, the revenues from member states to the EU, for example, um, according to a proposal put forward by Clemens Fuss um, and jean pierre Ferry by capping the amount that member states receive uh, for each option allowance um, at the current carbon price of 25 um, euro. Very interesting, I think, is the proposal for a border carbon adjustment mechanism for the EU ATS. It would burden imports into the EU uh, with the prevailing carbon price uh, based on the carbon intensity of their production, while exports would be exempted um, from EU carbon pricing to create a level playing field vis-a-vis -vis third countries. Um, a border carbon adjustment is an obvious candidate uh, for um, innovative own resource because it is related to an EU-wide carbon pricing mechanism and also due to the cross-border nature uh, of carbon emission. It is also um, it can also uh, be seen as a genuine pan-European uh, own resource. Its introduction should be also possible without treaty changes, and it could also be made compatible with uh, the WTO uh, rules. It bears considerable revenue uh, potential. It would be an additional reven uh, revenue uh, source. Um, no conflict between uh, member states and the European Union about uh, the revenues is to be expected. It could limit uh, carbon leakage and the so-called green paradox, and it could protect the competitiveness of the European industry. One final green own resource is related to uh, pricing uh, the carbon emissions of aviation, for example, through a carbon-based flight ticket. X is an obvious candidate also for an innovative own resource due to the cross-border nature of carbon emissions. Um, plus, we have currently a massive undertaxation of aviation, uh, EU-wide and world-wide, uh, because aviation taxes are hard to uh, enforce at the national level due to the potential uh, tax competition. Um, and the EU ETS is rather ineffective currently with respect um, to aviation. Um, the introduction of this um, of this uh, aviation-based own resource should be possible without treaty changes. Also, it has some, not an overwhelmingly high, but uh, also some non-negligible uh, revenue potential. And there would be limited conflicts only between member states and the EU about the revenues, uh, because only very few member states currently levy flight ticket uh, taxes. Um, and these, if they are levied at all, uh, have limited revenues. Now, to sum up, you, hear, you find here a summary evaluation uh, of the most interesting and currently uh, discussed candidates for sustainability-oriented own resources without being able to go uh, into details and well knowing uh, that we could debate extensively. Um, every plus, minus, uh, zero, and question mark in this table, um, the summary evaluation does show that there is not the ideal the one ideal candidate for um, innovative own resources to finance the EU budget, but there are various well-suited uh, and promising options, and particularly the green uh, options appear to be very well suited. Um, often their revenues cannot be clearly assigned um, to individual, to the specific member states. They are hardly enforceable at member state level. They are connected with important EU policies. Uh, they yield stable and, at least in the medium term, sufficient revenues, and they contribute uh, to the EU's climate goals. Um, we can also have a very, very uh, brief look at the legal basis of our candidates for sustainability-oriented uh, own resources without being able, again, to go into detail here. Uh, all our candidates, with the exception of the net wealth tax, can be introduced based on the current legal framework. Um, that means that no treaty changes would be required uh, to introduce them. Uh, the only prerequisite, uh, so to say, is um, the unanimity principle. That means every, uh, each and every member state would have to uh, agree to their introduction. Now let me come um, to some conclusions. Um, I think um, it's important to use the momentum that uh, is created by um, the reflections on 
flaws in uh, the EU and the EMO architecture uh, by the reflections uh, that we had in the last years on the future of EU finances, on integration scenarios, on the Green Deal, on um, the COVID uh, recovery plans to push to push these radical reforms in the EU budget and the EU system of own uh, resources. I also think that um, regardless of the absolute volume of the next MFF, um, it is absolutely indispensable um, to improve the current revenue structure uh, of the EU. Also, the Brexit talk should um, provide an opportunity to fundamentally reform the structure of the EU budget and the own resources system. And I think that a comprehensive sustainability orientation of the EU budget could be uh, and should be um, a key element to contribute to import important European strategies. Innovative sustainability oriented own resources are a good substitute for a part of current own resources um, and for an increase of current own resources to cover additional financing needs, um, including um, the financing needs um, that are caused uh, by the need to repay the debt incurred for the recovery and resilience, resilience um, fund. From an academic point of view, there is a really very sound rationale for such innovative own resources. There are a number of very suited candidates for innovative own resources were to be explored further. Um, they could be in, uh, implemented within the given legal framework and institutional setup. That means that member states would not have to give up uh, national fiscal sovereignty. And they may also um, contribute to a weakening of the net uh, position thinking that has been poisoning uh, the negotiations on the MFF during uh, the last decades. Um, there are several prerequisites for a successful implementation of innovative own resources. A crucial prerequisite um, is to strengthen the EU value added that is created by the MFF and also the recovery and resilience uh, facility. Generally, um, a stronger sustainability orientation of EU expenditures, because otherwise, um, particularly uh, those innovative tax-based own resources that are quite visible might even increase the resistance um, of citizens against uh, further deepening of European integration. And also package deals are important regarding uh, the structure of the own resources overall package uh, or basket, but also regarding the overall architecture of the MFF, the recovery and resilience facility and the own resources. System. Of course, and that's my final uh, slide, there are several open questions and issues, uh, many concrete details of the design of the debated innovative own resources are still open and have to be concretized and researched further, as well as their economic, social and ecological impact. Well, then there is the um, currently uh, less intense debate about uh, Eurozone budget uh, versus uh, the uh, EU budget. And last but not least, the issue whether effective corrective green own resources are able to yield sufficient revenues in the long uh, run is, of course, an important issue. So I leave it at that. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Margit. That was a very comprehensive overview of this important uh, debate, and I'm looking forward to coming back to uh, to discuss these issues, I'm sure. Uh, Jean-Pierre Vidal, for example, will have uh, some insights as to the way that the own resource debate is, is panning out in the European Council. That would be very interesting uh, here. Um, but before we uh, go to that, I'd like to take the third speaker, Francesco Saraceno, um, and give you the floor, uh, Francesco. Thank you very much, Andy. Let me share with you my my presentation. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first participation to this conference, actually, and I also regret not being there for the lunches uh, and coffee breaks uh, Sebastian was mentioning in, in the introduction. So uh, 
uh, my I was asked to actually focus on the uh, spending side of the uh, of the issue of investment and and uh, and the tools that we're putting in place for the uh, uh, for the next phase I would say of this reaction to the pandemic. It's actually um, a long-term perspective that it has been introduced with the uh, recovery fund, which I think is. Uh, very much uh, welcome. So, uh, very quickly, what I will do, I will try to go very quickly on the issues related to public investment and the recovery plan. I will not say anything new for this audience, so I can be very quick on that. And then I will act I will uh, focus most of my presentation on uh, two recent publications I've been involved in. One is a, a European public investment outlook that I co-edited with uh, a number of uh, colleagues uh, from other institutions. Uh, and then uh, focus on um, uh, 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 another uh, research project that is also ongoing, which is actually focusing on the post-pandemic reaction, uh, reaction and the uh, European uh, investment program, and that will be uh, part of the, uh, uh, my second part of the presentation. Then I will, I will also try to spend a few minutes on uh, something that is kind of interesting, in my opinion, and has been really overlooked in the current discussion, which is the uh, capacity that we will have to actually spend this huge amount of money that, that has been made available by the uh, recovery fund. I will just spend a few words on that, but I think it's uh, I, uh, it's important to actually raise uh, the, the issue in this forum. And then I will uh, give a quick conclusion on what it means for the current debate on macroeconomic governance. So let me start with uh, the part that everybody knows. Actually, I took these, I copied and pasted this slide from the uh, Commission uh, uh, Recovery Fund fact sheet. And basically, it's uh, the uh, recovery fund is not, uh, at least the way I see it, it, was not designed to actually be the first line of defense against the pandemics and the uh, economic fallout from the pandemics. I mean, these. Jean-Pierre Vidal said it uh, quite uh, uh, in detail in his presentation. There, there have been other tools that have been put in place for uh, for the first reaction, for the emergency reaction to the pandemics. On one side, the, the ECB, and on the other, national governments with their support to their own economy. So the here, uh, uh, the uh, RRF, so the, the uh, recovery uh, facility, has since the very beginning been uh, seen as the uh, tool to actually uh, uh, give uh, traction to the recovery after the uh, emergency phase, and as such has been uh, uh, really focused on uh, public investment. And then, of course, this public investment, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes, this public investment needs to be determined quite broadly, not just as physical investment, but more in a, in a broader uh, uh, sense. The other thing that I would like to uh, uh, to uh, focus on here, that is in my opinion very important, because also it also shows that the European Commission had been on the I would say, let me use a, a, a simplistic term, has been on the right track since the very beginning, because the uh, recovery fund has actually been nested quite naturally in the uh, work program that the Commission has actually implemented and, and, and set forward when it actually took office before the pandemics in, in December uh, 2019. Uh, so basically, as uh, was already mentioned by Jean-Pierre Vidal, the two main axes are the digital transformation and the environmental transition. <clears throat> the other thing on which I can be very quick is on the need of public investment. Of course, public investment has been basically uh, wiped out from the uh, debate, the European debate, but I would say on, from the macroeconomic debate uh, at large for a long period of time, it came back with force after the global financial uh, crisis. Basically, the, uh, the joint combination of very low interest rates and a capital stock, public capital stock that had over time deteriorated and uh, degraded has basically led to a number of assessments on the importance of public investment. Here, I, I quote the, uh, the IMF uh, World Economic Outlook of the fall 2014, where it, it was actually mentioned that because of high multipliers, high returns of, uh, to public investment, basically the, uh, the, uh, a, a massive program of public investment would actually pay for itself, so in some sense would become 
a free lunch. And since that uh, terminal uh, contribution by the uh, IMF, we had lots of other literature actually uh, showing how the, in the current situation, between the zero over bound uh, marginal returns of public uh, uh, capital, the public investment is a, uh, it's basically a, a high return, low cost uh, uh, use of uh, government resources. Uh, <clears throat> so actually, uh, within that debate, we had uh, we had decided before the pandemic to uh, to uh, try to put together a set uh, a number of researchers on uh, dealing with these issues. So we. Uh, we, we published uh, in last June a uh, report, uh, a European Public Investment Outlook, which we, uh, in which we had 30, more than 30 authors actually from very different backgrounds. Some of them were academics, some of them were more more uh, pu uh, public policy oriented. The idea would be, uh, had, and still is, to have this outlook to be actually a sort of uh, 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 regular series coming out and, and giving a state of the art of the uh, uh, of the state of public investment and basically the outlook is divided into parts one is the outlook and the other is a focus on uh, more uh, specific challenge that we find uh, to be uh, important and as I said before I will not enter into the details actually but I mean what I said before is that the report has already adopted as a sort of common a line linking all the different chapters, the idea that we need to, to see investment in a broad sense in a, as whatever uh, 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 expenditure increases human as well as physical capital. So we, I will give you the list of the chapters in the next slide. As you will see, basically m many of the things we, we deal with in the outlook and many of the things that have been actually very much uh, in the uh, current debate on uh, public investment uh, go well beyond the standard in, uh, physical infrastructure definition. I think this is a very important thing that we have to keep in mind, especially as we see that, for example, the uh, investment in public health and in uh, education uh, uh, seems to be uh, high on the uh, agenda uh, in, in Europe, and I repeat, this is uh, rather uh, good news. Um, I won't go into the details. So, as I say, the first part of the outlook had uh, contributions from um, on, a on a number of different countries. Uh, some of the others are actually uh, among the guests of the conferences. Uh, 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 and basically, the picture that comes out from the first part of the outlook is that in most European countries, public investment has, of course, decreased. There was a long term a downward trend of public investment that accelerated with the uh, global financial crisis of 2008. Basically, public investment was the item that, of public expenditure that was most affected by the fiscal consolidation wave that started in 2012. The, uh, this is not because uh, there was a saturation of public infrastructure, so there was still, actually there was an infrastructure gap that widened after 2012 in most uh, countries, and then there were there were some differences between uh, from country to country. Let me just give you the example of Germany, our host uh, host uh, uh, country, where the uh, the uh, uh, authors of the of the of the chapter for German. Germany basically uh, uh, give an estimate of the need of public investment of around 450 billion over the next decades. It's around 45 billion per year, so it's a, a quite large uh, number. But I mean, the same numbers actually were found for France, for Italy, for Spain, and for other uh, uh, countries. And then the second part of the outlook, we actually uh, went into the details of a number of issues of our subjects. Once again, I won't go into the details of all the different chapters. The, the outlook can be downloaded for free, so you're welcome to actually do it. And basically, as you can see, we went through the uh, we we go from uh, research and develop so investment in research and development, where the public uh, uh, sector has also been. Uh, 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 retreating and, and there needs to be a push on that social investment so investment in the, in welfare this chapter is of course particularly particularly relevant right now as we see how the uh, the uh, 
weakening of the welfare state has been one major problem in the uh, reaction to the current pandemics. There, there was a chapter on transport, I will go back to that because we have been working on that also after the pandemic. Uh, the uh, financing of the environmental transition and uh, also the importance of the geographical distribution of public investment and of the role of cohesion policy in actually making that, uh, that uh, 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 more efficient and to boost convergence in uh, across European countries and across European regions. So as you can see, the real, uh, really what we uh, wanted to highlight with this report is that we need to actually think of investment in a, a non, not simply in an accounting way, but actually as some sort of functional, in a functional, a functional approach to public investment and to think of it as a way for us to uh, boost human as well as physical capital. The second small, uh, the second um, uh, uh, item I wanted to tackle here is on the, is this joint work with uh, IMK and and we uh, WIIW, which is basically a, 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 the result of that joint work, is the first step of an on ongoing research project on public investment in Europe. And it's uh, a, a policy brief in which we focused on the, uh, we started from the consideration that the recovery plan, as it has been decided and as is being discussed right now, is basically um, uh, uh, very much focused on financing what remains mostly national uh, uh, investment plans. So basically the uh, commission is raising uh, resources and then uh, distributing them either as grants or as loans to the different countries for these countries to carry on investment plans, which of course, I mean, there, is a, there will be, and um, it's a very welcome actually conditionality on the utilization of these funds. So these funds will have to be used in a sort of consistent way across all the European countries, but it remains that we don't have, we are missing in the recovery fund, we are missing a truly European investment uh, uh, dimension. And so what we do in the policy brief, we, uh, uh, we uh, propose an investment program over a long period of time or over a decade, it's a two trillion uh, euros investment program. We focus on three main items, public health, transport, and the, uh, the decarbonization of the economy. And we give a few examples. We are, we were very aware well, while we were writing these texts that this is just, these are just examples. We could find many other projects that are, that would go along in the same directions. But I repeat, the three, the three, uh, items we chose are, have a truly European, uh, dimension. And then these, uh, two trillion investment program would have also a national pillar in which we, we uh, there would be support given to the uh, country, the, to the hardest hit countries from the crisis. So this would be, if you want, the existing recovery uh, uh, fund, and then there would be the national, um, the, the European, Euro-wide, EU uh, 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 dimension that is important. And this would be uh, the uh, division of uh, this, the way we, we actually came to this number of two trillion uh, in, for the uh, 10 years, 2021-2030, as you can see, there was, there's a program on health, uh, a um, project for a, for a rapid train network, and the um, the uh, creation, the electrification, you know, the creation of the grids and a sort of the uh, highways for the carbonization of the economies. And the national pillar that you see in brown is the um, more or less equivalent, actually smaller in size than the current recovery fund. So the idea uh, of this, of these three items, the, these three items would have first uh, the, uh, for health, the idea would be, would be to have a, a European uh, to strengthen the European agencies actually to 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 to, to merge the European agencies, the existing European agencies, and to strengthen their capacity to both supply medicines and uh, uh, equipment, 
And also, let me stress that because this is coming very clear in these very days where unfortunately we are dealing again with the uh, pandemics, also to try to better coordinate and to incentivate mobility across countries for uh, staff, for personnel, for doctors, because what we are seeing now is that even countries that have been increasing their capacity, for example, in intensive care units are short of people to operate that. You can quite quickly actually uh, uh, increase your physical capacity in healthcare, but then the human capacity, so the, the staff that is capable of operating this increased capacity might actually be missing. And this is something, I mean, we basically miss the doctors to actually run the extra intensive care units. And so the uh, one part of what we proposed was precisely to have this European uh, uh, both uh, dimension, both in training and in allocating resources across different countries, depending on the needs. The train network would be a, uh, we have very, a number of very cool uh, figures, actually, uh, pictures in this, in the, in the policy brief. I mean, it would be a, a network linking different, uh, different, different capitals of the uh, European Union. It would cost around 7% of GDP uh, uh, over the uh, 10 uh, years program. And of course, the, uh, the idea is to develop and to reduce carbon emission being to, uh, to, uh, to uh, 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 air travel. The, we make the example, for example, of the Paris-Berlin uh, Paris uh, uh, branch of that would take around four hours, so it would be perfectly competitive with, a, with, uh, with air travel. And the other thing that I would like to highlight here it would also participate to the European effort to rethink its industrial policy because it would be a sort of European champion. And we know that there has been a, a very interesting debate in the past couple of years on the on how to revamp, actually how to, to create, I would say, truly European industrial policy. The third item I was mentioning before is the idea of electrifying the Green Deal in some sense. And basically, on one side, the idea was uh, to boost the uh, fundamental research, so boost uh, the uh, research and development uh, part of the of the uh, of the plan, and second, try, try to create the uh, the try, try, uh, there is a plan to actually uh, um, create an integrated electricity grid that would allow to better allocate the uh, resources and the uh, uh, and electricity across countries depending on demand and uh, and capacity to to, to create it. Uh, the idea we put forward is that this should be actually uh, uh, should go faster, and so the we should uh, we should allocate some resources to in, to uh, to boost that project because that would of course mean the but that would of course. Uh, 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 accelerate the transition out of oil and of fossil uh, fuels. Uh, <clears throat> last, as I say, and I'm going to conclude in a few minutes. Last, I would say, uh, last thing I wanted to mention is that the uh, in the current uh, in the current uh, agreement in the, that was reached by the Council in July, the idea would be that mo that the the funds of the recovery fund would be allocated and need to be spent before 2020. Uh, would be uh, uh, allocated to projects and, and spent before 2026. And already at the beginning of September, a, uh, an interesting paper by uh, Zolt Darvas of Google showed that for many countries, uh, this uh, actually could be a problem because there are a few countries in Europe that have a very a low, uh, very poor record in uh, already in, in managing the uh, ordinary uh, EU funding and structural funds, and the uh, uh, and that short deadline could actually um, bias the uh, the uh, decision of countries towards larger projects in which uh, that would be more easily. Con uh, Manage and so uh, in which the, mo the, the money could be, could be spent uh, uh, faster, and that could go against the uh, the uh, implementation of uh, micro investment projects that 
in some cases would probably be more efficient and growth enhancing. And so I want just to raise this issue because as we don't still don't have an agreement between the European Parliament and the Council, you know that there are a number of issues linked to both the uh, linkage with the, uh, the multi-annual uh, financial framework and with the issue of conditionality on, on the respect of human rights and so on and so forth. Uh, one thing that could also put, be put on the floor is to reassess the timeline of the fund and maybe extend a little bit the time for these funds to be uh, spent, especially because, as I said at the very beginning, we have a long-term perspective. Uh, uh, the, the fund has been built on the idea of a medium to long-term perspective, so adding a couple of years to the um, uh, deadline to allocate and spend the money doesn't seem to be such a big uh, uh, and problematic issue. Uh, let me conclude with a few considerations. This renewed interest in public investment comes at a very interesting point because, as many of you uh, certainly know, last February, uh, just a few weeks before we went into our first lockdown, I'm afraid first and not last lockdown, the Commission launched a, a consultation process on, the, uh, on its fiscal rules. Basically, there was a very harsh assessment by the Commission on uh, itself on the working of the Stability and Growth Pact, and so the Commission has launched this. Well, this uh, consultation process was meant to be um, concluded by the summer and to lead to a new proposal by the Commission by, before the end of the current year, before the end of 2020. Of course, this has been completely derailed by the, uh, by the um, by the pandemics, but not the process itself. So the timing has been derailed, but the Commission is still working on this consultation pro process. And so it maybe is a good time to actually uh, uh, repropose a, a golden rule, so an, a, a preferential treatment of public investment uh, within the fiscal framework, of fiscal, the European fiscal rule. We all know that there are plenty of exceptions that have been introduced over the years to the Stability and Growth Pact, some of them linked to the, uh, to the destination of funds uh, uh, towards investment. It would be, I think, uh, 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 actually important to, for these things to actually be embedded in the actual rules, not, not in the exception, but in the actual rule. And of course, the, consistent with what I, what I said so far, the idea would be that uh, public investment would be excluded from the stability pact should actually be meant in a broad sense, what I would call an augmented golden rule. So even items such as, for example, investment in healthcare or in education that are, do not enter into the accounting definition of public investment could be the, um, could be the uh, 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 part of these uh, uh, set of expenditure that would be taken out of the uh, of the deficit figures uh, for the rule. Uh, it's of course a, a, uh, an ongoing discussion, but it's in my opinion a good moment to uh, to uh, try to push forward this idea. And of course, a renewed focus on public investment is uh, would also be an important part of the. Uh, um, discussion I mentioned before on uh, industrial policy. Public investment could and actually should become one of the arms of industrial policy if industrial policy becomes eventually and finally a, a one of the priorities of the European uh, Union. And at that, in that point, at that point, we should have a number of things that enter into the uh, picture, the transactional aspects of infrastructure investment, as I mentioned before, we, we need to focus on a truly European project. Uh, the, as I said before, definition, broad definition of what is growth-oriented expenditure. And finally, we should look at multiple ways to finance uh, these investments from the EU, uh, EU budget, from other sources of financing. And of course, member states would remain very much important. I think the uh, consultation prog process introduced by the Commission was uh, very welcome and I would say uh, 
an important step forward. It was an important uh, um, uh, breaking point with respect to the previous uh, commission. And I think we should use this actual break to uh, push forward these ideas. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Thanks very much for flagging up the, a wide range of issues that we have on, uh, on the spending side, having looked at the income side, so issues about uh, the timing of spending, the priorities, the right volume, and how the debate on, on the more or less permanent fiscal rules sort of interact with the, with the debate about more or less temporary um, support measures. So uh, we're now going into the uh, interactive section of the um, of the session. Uh, thanks to all the presenters, uh, also for the discipline and self-discipline. So we're we're pretty much on time. Um, I'd like to encourage those of you who are registered as attendees to uh, you know either raise your hand or. Um, uh, or write your questions into the uh, the chat. We we weren't sure ex ante how many people would be uh, as it were actively live here as attendees and how many following on the live stream. So we now see it's actually about three to one. So more people are on the live stream they can't actually then pose uh, questions. So I would encourage those you who are registered as attendees to do that. Um, in the meantime, I will uh, start perhaps a first a first round. And um, Jean-Pierre, if I may, uh, I would like to start by maybe throwing back some of the issues that the, that the two uh, other colleagues have uh, have raised, uh, as it were, back at you. And to ask, I realize you know you you know there are some diplomatic restrictions, but maybe you can give us a bit of a sense about what the uh, political thinking is on uh, uh, within the the council. On some of these issues, so let let me raise a a, a couple. I mean, the, the first is um, we know that there is uncertainty about the future of next generation EU. Now, there's the still the issue of the the rule of law to be to be sorted out. Um, what what do you see as the perspective? Is there a plan B if <laughs> if agreement um, uh, cannot be reached? Um, what what is your view on the, on the own uh, resource debate, the, the issues that, that Margaret uh, uh, raised? Um, how do you rate the political feasibility of some of these uh, proposals? And then maybe on the spending side, what uh, I mean, the implication of, of some of the things that Francesco was saying is very much that uh, you know, we're likely to need more spending, even more spending than a, than a fully effective uh, next generation EU program in the, in the medium term. Um, is that is that feasible? Do you do you do you share that view? Um, maybe we we could take that as a as a start, and then I'll come back to the to the other two two presenters. Jean Pierre, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your questions. I mean. The uh, uncertainty, what you call uncertainty about the future of next generation EU, I mean, it's not uh, uncertainty, it's a normal process of negotiation between the Council of the European Union and currently I mean, it's the German presidency and the European Parliament. Uh, Jean-Pierre, ah, okay. You, you didn't hear me, or I can't hear you now. You disappeared for a few seconds. You were saying that it was a normal consultation process, and then we lost you. Exactly. exactly. Normal consultation. Yes, okay. So, I repeat, I, yeah. I mean, there is a deal uh, that was agreed in July, so the, the European Council deal on the recovery fund, on next generation EU, on the multiannual financial framework. And now it's normal. I mean, there are normal procedure in Europe. It's at the legislative stage. And this is the responsibility of the German presidency, so the Council of the European Union, to, uh, to take this forward and to take forward the negotiation with the European Parliament. 
and this is being done as we speak. There are trilogues and meetings almost every day in Brussels between the European Parliament, the Council, and discussion. And uh, I mean, from my standpoint, I, I do hope that uh, an agreement will be reached uh, any time. I mean, there is no. Uh, this is might be a little bit later than some people expect, and I think it's normal in democracies that there are discussion on legislation on different standpoints, and I. I trust that in democracies people are also reasonable and know that at some point one has to, you know, kind of uh, agree on a, on a deal that is very important for uh, for the union, for the future of the union, for European citizens, for workers, for for businesses, because this is really, I mean, uh, an economic policy response that is uh, very much needed in the current circumstances. On the own resource decision, I mean, that's uh, also a part of. Um, of the July uh, uh, European Council uh, uh, conclusions and, uh, and agreement. And then, as was well explained, I mean, there are kind of different elements that are mentioned there. There are own resource decisions that are actually, I mean, the decision is taken, for example, on the um, on the, um, uh, the um, own resource decision based on non-recycled plastic. So that's decided and will be introduced and will apply as of the 1st of January 2021. That's in the in the European Council conclusion. And then there is a kind of roadmap or a plan for additional own resources. And there is uh, the Commission is invited to put forward in the first semester of next year, in 2021, a proposal for a carbon adjustment mechanism and a proposal on a digital levy. And there the idea is to have them introduced at the latest uh, on the first by the first of January 2023. Then there is also an invitation to the Commission to put forward a revised proposal on the uh, ETS. And uh, uh, as you rightly uh, pointed out in your presentation, Margit, I mean, with a possible extension to aviation of and maritime. And then there is, you know, it's not the end of the story. And uh, because also it's not, you know, Europe is there to stay. And this discussion, this budgetary discussion, as uh, the institutional discussion we have here in Europe, I mean, is always there. It's part of the debate between member states, between citizens, and it's normal. And then the agreement is that in the course of the next MFF, work has to be, to be carried forward with a view to the introduction of other own resources. And there it includes and may include financial transaction tax, but it might also include other things. We don't know yet. I mean, so there is a kind of roadmap um, that will have to be, uh, to be taken forward in the coming years. Then on the spending side, whether there is a need for more spending and what we will do in the longer term, I think true. I mean, there, there will be discussion. I mean, very much discussion about, you know, kind of what has to be assigned at the level of the member states, at the level of the union, how to organize things. And this is part, I mean, of, again, of these uh, general debates that we have about European integration and our best to organize, let's say, an institutional framework. I think that at, uh, what I would say at this stage is that we are very much focused on the implementation on, of the current deal. What is extremely important, first of all, I mean, is to finalize the legislative process on next generation EU on the multiannual financial framework to, to, to make it happen. So to implement it and implementation will be very important. And then, I mean, I guess in the, in the second stage, I mean, there will be discussion about uh, what we can do in the future and uh, what we can, uh, whether we, we can do more, whether member states want to, to do more. For the time being, uh, uh, this deal is uh, it's clear that it is an exceptional and uh, response to this crisis. So, I mean, this is not kind of uh, a door open, I mean, to uh, any kind of uh, future spending. There is an agreement on this deal. There is an agreement on union borrowing to finance grants to member states. That is kind of a game changer in Europe. I mean, something that is extremely creative. It's uh, both creative, but it's also, I mean, has been implemented within the community methods. That is also important. So I think we have a kind of... Uh, you know, uh, all, uh, let's say, negotiators, participants, and institutions have shown an extreme degree of creati creativeness within the current framework. Now it has to be implemented. The own resource decision uh, 
also has to be ratified by all member states to allow for this borrowing and uh, and the discussion will uh, will continue as is normal in Europe because we are I mean a union always in progress and towards uh, further development and uh, that's uh, that's uh, normal uh, that's normal and welcome thank you thank you uh, uh, Jean Pierre so we have now our first question from the floor and I'd like to ask for Hans Jörg Herr to uh, be allowed to join the, the debate and ask his question. Uh, I cannot hear Hans Jörg. Is no, in Hans Jörg. We can see you now, but we cannot hear you. Okay, what what should I do? No, no now I, now we can hear you. Now we can hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, should I ask my question? Please. Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, these nice uh, presentations. I I actually have uh, two questions. The first question the question goes to Margit. Um, uh, why not just take, let's say, 3% of value added tax to transfer it automatically to the EU budget? Um, uh, is it not possible? Um, I mean, that would be relatively easy to do. Uh, that's my more technical question. My, my next question is, um, in, in last conferences, there was always a big debate. Uh, if you have a monetary union, you need a central fiscal policy, active fiscal policy. You need uh, uh, joint credits taken on, on the central level. Now we have this big recovery program, the first time taking uh, uh, jointly uh, credit on the EU level. Um, my question is, what, what is your thinking about this topic that we if we have a monetary union, we need also an active fiscal policy. That means this dimension of, of, of the recovery fund, joint credits, and probably more fiscal room. What do you think about this? Thank you. Thank you, Hans-Jörg. Uh, mm -hmm. OK. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, why not take just 3% of VAT? Well, uh, this is basically the system that we have now. I mean, we take some percentage, uh, we have some call rate um, uh, based on um, uh, member states' uh, GNI, and we have some call rate on a statistical base yeah, uh, that is uh, basically based on um, on, on the VAT um, tax base. Yeah, um, This, of course, would be an easy system, uh, not very complicated, but it has the central drawback of um, it that it would not contribute at all to uh, EU policies and strategies. And this is, I think, uh, really a wasted, um, uh, a wasted chance, yeah, if we, if we, um, if we further do not introduce any, um, any, uh, innovative own resources that could contribute actively, uh, to tackling, um, the, the most important challenges, uh, that we are facing. And one of these most important challenges uh, is climate change. I mean, climate change doesn't go away just because of the Corona crisis, uh, but it 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 poses big challenges for all, uh, not only uh, for the EU and its member states, but uh, worldwide. Yeah, and if we want to reach the climate goals um, that we have, and that will be um, will be even more ambitious. Yeah, according to the plans of the uh, European Commission. Uh, we need to use all levers and all instruments that we have. And there is one very powerful instrument, and these are taxes. And this instrument, for several reasons, because of tax avoidance, tax competition, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, can be used only very insufficiently um, at the EU level. And at the same time, um, the EU framework offers the opportunity, uh, in principle, to use these um, instruments uh, more effectively, more efficiently, and the current situation is really efficient, is really highly inefficient because currently member states' tax systems are not able 
to incorporate environmental taxes to a sufficient degree uh, because they many of them are not um or only insufficiently enforceable uh, on member state level, and at the same time, member states have to rely heavily on labor taxes, you know, which are distortive uh, from an employment, from a growth, uh, etc., um, and also from a distributive um, you know, perspective. Um, but also, I mean, it's not only green-owned resources; we have to use more. Um, also, other uh, owned resources would be. Uh, important. I would have preferred, for example, the FTT to be introduced much earlier. I mean, the uh, the current um, uh, conclusions uh, by the European Council basically mean that we have to wait uh, for another at least seven years uh, for the FTT, FTT to be introduced. And I mean, we have had ten years of um, of uh, lengthy discussions and preparations uh, among uh, the coalition of the willing. So I think. The discussion is rather progressed um, at at the EU level, and maybe we should really be more courageous and use the impetus uh, and the impulses that this current crisis is giving um, to this to, to to these kind of discussions. What about a more active fiscal policy? Well, this is a really big uh, question. Um, actually. Um, I think, um, well, in principle, the EU, you know that uh, better than me, uh, Hans Jörg, is not in allowed basically to incur debt, and that this now uh, is being done um, on an exceptional basis. I think this is a, a rather big step. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, um, but but this is something that that other people can discuss. Um, I think this uh, more competently than I can do that. Um, I'm not sure whether whether the current neither the the, the institutional framework or uh, the political situation uh, is far enough um, to uh, to allow the EU on on a permanent basis to incur that. But this is something, yeah, that I think should be discussed. Uh, thank you, thank you, Margaret. Maybe I can ask a. Uh, a question to to Francesco. Before I do, just again to the uh, uh, to the attendees. Um, in fact, it, it worked now quite well with Hans Jörg. Again, this is the first time we've. Uh... Andy, can I also answer on, on fiscal policy? Do you mind if I answer? The... In a second, Francesco. Yes, please do. Um, uh, so just to uh, again to the attendees, it, it's fine if you just uh, use the button on the right to raise your hand, as it were, to ask a question. We, as I say, this is the first time we've used this system to organize such a big conference, so we were a little bit nervous, but it worked very well now with, with Hans Jörg, so uh, try that uh, again. So you don't need to write a long question in the chat, uh, just uh, raise your hand and uh, and I'll have you uh, given the floor as well. So, Francesco, uh, to please do answer that question. I'd like to ask you something a bit about what you said about timing and about the multipliers. So, um, we know from the literature that the Multipliers on public investment tend to be higher than the multipliers on other forms of government uh, government spending. Um, on the other hand, there's all, always this issue about timing. Public investment tends to be, uh, you know, longer in the planning uh, than, you know, uh, transfers, for example. And some of the things that we discussed in the publication that you referred to, um, how to spend it, of course. You know, require planning processes and, and and could be quite time consuming. So, what's your what's your view on that? Um, some authors, like from Bruegel or from Seps, are a bit skeptical about how quickly countries can can ramp up uh, public spending. Uh, I don't know what your view on that is. Maybe from your uh, from your work with uh, with the thirty authors you mentioned, did you look at how? How feasible it is to uh, to accelerate uh, the public spending on on infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, maybe you could take that question along with the with the other issue. I, I will start with the, I mean I will start with the um, well, I will mix the two actually. Uh, the uh, uh, I think the the answer by Hans Jörg needs to be separated in two. So uh, we uh, first. Is fiscal policy back in town in the game? Uh, because, as uh, he said in the previous, I mean, 
for a long time, monetary policy was believed to be the only uh, uh, kid in town. And if money, monetary policy was the only kid in town, we had a problem with the European Monetary Union because, of course, we had an imbalance, an unbalanced policy mix. We only had a common policy and no, uh, uh, and no specific country uh, uh, tool. To that question, my answer would be yes, and would have been yes for the past few years. I mean, since 2010, at least in the academic uh, literature, fiscal policy is back. And as I mentioned even in my presentation that even the uh, large organizations like the OECD and the IMF are today much more willing to, to consider the utilization of fiscal policy as a stabilization tool. Uh, so I would I would say that that is the um, so that part of the uh, of the debate we certainly went forward with respect to a few years uh, back, and of course within that part there is issue of the uh, decision of whether fiscal policy should be more current or, or uh, current expenditure or investment investment as you say is consistent and in most empirical studies we see, we look at is as consistently higher multipliers in the medium run. Sometimes the short-term multiplier is much shorter because you have all the implementation uh, uh, lags uh, that are important. This is why I actually say in my presentation that I always saw since day one the recovery fund as a medium-term tool. I mean, uh, those who say that in the, in the Italian debate, for example, have been some polemical arguments on the fact that this the recovery fund would come in too late, et cetera, et cetera. I thought, I thought that debate was completely misplaced. I mean, the recovery fund is a medium-term uh, tool, and we want it to be a medium-term tool precisely because it deals with investment, and investment has some sort of incompressible uh, um, delays. So I would say that this is not an issue as long as we don't see it as a counter cyclical stabilization tool for today's uh, crisis. That leads me to the more philosophical part of the question, is the recovery fund a European budget, and a, a, a European stabilization uh, tool? I would say no. I would say no, because I, I also I say, I pointed out in the, in the presentation, I mean, the recovery fund is just a very, I mean, I don't want at all to down Plate, it's a very important step forward. Margit said rightly so that is temporary and um, limited. I mean, I think you see temporary and limited every two words every time a German official speaks about it. They say temporary and limited uh, uh, 10 times a sentence. Uh, but I mean, we all know how many temporary tools eventually became permanent in Europe. So I mean, once things are on the floor, they might actually evolve and become and become permanent, especially if we manage to make them uh, successful. So, and, and, uh, <clears throat> so it will, it might become, it might be the embryo of a uh, EU-wide stabilization uh, tool, but it is clear that now it is not, because as I said before in my presentation, this is just a very powerful and I repeat groundbreaking financing tool of national fiscal policies. And let me add that maybe this is just the way it should be because we don't live in the European, in, in the United States of Europe. We still have that the uh, sovereign decision on tax and spend stays, likely so, where the accountability to voters is, with, which is in national government. So we can imagine having uh, uh, EU-wide projects as the ones we uh, have discussed in our joint policy brief, Andy, but I mean, it remains that the bulk of fiscal policy in today's Europe needs to stay within uh, member countries. So we need active fiscal policies. I think this is now an evidence in the literature. For the moment, they are within national uh, governments. This ability, uh, the recovery fund is a huge facilitator of these uh, active fiscal policies. It's not yet and I repeat, maybe it should not be for the moment a EU-wide fiscal instrument because we don't have a EU-wide government. Let me say it uh, uh, clearly. Thank you for that answer, uh, uh, Francesco. I have now uh, uh, Tommaso Ferrarezi asking for the floor. I've just done the button. Uh, Tommaso, I hope you can... Ask your question now. Uh, 
May take a second. Uh, hello, Thomas. We see you now. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Please. Okay. So thank you for the nice panel. I have a question for uh, Francesco Saraceno. Actually, uh, I, I was reasoning about lessons we learned from the Great Recession. And I am, um, and uh, in particular, on I, I'm thinking about the choices. Uh, it seems that the Italian government is uh, doing by making its plan uh, in the for the use of the recovery fund. And I, I was, I, I I don't know whether do you think that uh, there is a sort of there may be, there might be a fear of a reversal in the acceptance of a public debt uh, in the medium term, as it happened uh, during the Great Recession. Driving, I mean, the, 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 the choices of policy makers in, uh, I mean, I mean, in, a undershooting, uh, the policy response so that uh, they, they will be cautious, cautious uh, in, uh, undertaking public investment, especially I'm, I'm thinking about the, the debt financed part of the recovery fund. So the part that, I mean, in the end, they, they have to repay, uh, Thank you. Francesco? Thank you, Tommaso. Uh... Well, let me start by saying that we will have to repay everything. I mean, even the, even the grants part will have to be repaid because, I mean, there will be, especially if the own resources don't materialize, there will be an increase in our contribution to the budget. It's just a question, like a mortgage. We get the money now, we'll pay later, but all the the uh, recovery fund will be paid. I mean, this is just a, uh, so there, will there be a reverse? I don't know. I mean, this is a very difficult question. Uh, I mean, anybody who ventures in, in forecasts and predictions right now, I mean, is very brave. I mean, so I don't want to, to be, uh, to, to, to be too final on that. We saw in 2008, 2009, expansionary policies in reaction to the global financial crisis and then we also saw a very quick reversal starting in 2010 and we went back to you know, let's call it austerity for to make it simple will it happen again now uh, it might it might i mean it's not uh, we we don't know in two years time if we will go back to a big emphasis on public debt and, and to uh, the uh, fiscal consolidation. I think there are a few things now that we didn't have in 2010 that make, uh, make me think that we might eventually, I mean, we might not go back to the austerity we, we, we saw in the early years 2010. The first thing is that we are all on the same boat in some sense. I mean, the increase in public debt has been generalized. And so there, it's uh, going to be, difficult, for example, to reinstate the stability pact as it was. I mean, you know, Andy, I think, uh, mentioned that in the very beginning, it has been suspended. Basically, it's not been suspended. We, we, we are all in the uh, exemption clause, if you want, of the in suspension clause of the stability pact. I don't see uh, that to come back uh, very soon, actually, at all, uh, because uh, Public debt is, is so large in so many countries that in, if the stability pact had to come back, all countries would have to undergo very strong austerity. And I don't see that as a politically feasible. Forget the economic uh, nonsense that that would imply. I don't see it as a politically feasible uh, strategy. So that is the first element that makes me think that maybe things will be uh, different. And the second, now I'm very cautious because I speak in front of lots of Germans in the, on, on, so I'm, 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 the second, I, I think I see a change of attitude of the German government. And maybe it's more permanent than just a short term thing. First of all, the, uh, the global context, the global geopolitical context is very different from 2010. So it will be harder for Germany to neglect our a small European courtyard and go look elsewhere for its export. So the stability of the euro and of the eurozone might now be more valuable to Germany uh, than it was in 2010 because of all the ge geopolitical tensions that will not go away after next Tuesday, whatever happens at the, uh, in the American election. 
And the second is that it seems that, well, while I repeat, I speak, I'm very cautious here because I speak in front of many distinguished German economists, it seems that a new generation of German economists is uh, coming up and, and getting into the uh, right institutions and they don't seem to share all the uh, uh, views of the old generation. So there might be a permanent change in the, in the German uh, uh, political, eco uh, economic policy landscape. And that also is something that is different from 2010. But I repeat, if you ask me, will there be austerity in, uh, in, in three years? My, my, real, my, my real answer, honest answer is I have no idea. Thank you, uh, Francesco. So maybe some distinguished German economists in the audience will, would like to uh, to come back about that. If not, I might be tempted myself to uh, to have a go. But in the meantime, maybe uh, as no one else has asked for the floor, please please do so. Uh, maybe I could ask two questions. One is maybe I don't know. The first I think is more towards uh, uh, Margaret, but others may have a, a view too. Um, it's about the border adjustment levy. So. This seems to me to have many very attractive features, right? It seems to tick, even in your table, it ticks a lot of the boxes in a, in a quite literal uh, sense, right? And, and, and more generally as well, um, you know, achieving, uh, also underpinning the green agenda, protecting competitiveness and, and, and jobs, stopping carbon, carbon leakage and stuff. Maybe you could say a little bit more about that, but maybe also, uh, Jean-Pierre, you have a view too. Um, you know, something about the sort of, revenue as one might expect and of course also the political feasibility issue right we know that it has to be wto uh conforming um how how easy is that to do uh will, is this likely to provoke a trade war i mean is this maybe you could say something on those lines and another question again more perhaps to, to jean pierre but others may have a view what about this the loan component the loan component in uh, in next generation EU so my institute uh, the IMK we just did a, a a quantitative study we basically set the loan component at zero right we, we just looked at the grants because there's a sort of fundamental uncertainty there about how many countries are going to take out the loans now we, we've seen that under the shore program many countries have have not taken out the loans um, Simply because they see no uh, no great advantage. Um, do you or any of the panelists? Do you have a view about the, the the loan component? Is it is it fine if the countries they don't need the loans they don't take them? That's also fine. What, what, what's your what's your view about this or your expectations about this? But maybe I give the floor first to to Margit and then to to Jean Pierre if you agree, and then maybe Francesco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for this question. I mean, that's a, that's a very broad question too, and it's a very complicated, actually, and also technically complicated um, discussion. Um, basically, I know um, there are all these fears about, um, yeah, risking a trade war, but actually, I mean, one just has to um, has to bear in mind that um, the main intention um, of the proposal is to create a level playing field. Yeah to compensate for competitive disadvantages that Europe has because it has a, a carbon pricing uh, um, at a level uh, that's not uh, that's kind of undercut by other regions in the world. So it's not kind of an active attack yeah, uh, on other parts of the world, but it's rather uh, kind of a defense yeah, and, and a defense uh, of the um, competitiveness of the European industry. Um, what um, what concerns uh, the WTO compatibility is, of course, I think that's one of the crucial issues. Um, I'm no legal expert, and I don't uh, see myself fit to, to really discuss this question here in detail. Um, but there are, in the meantime, there are some uh, interesting works. Uh, one uh, from my colleague, uh, Inter Alia, uh, Alexander Krenek, who has in detail um, um, uh, 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 explored uh, this question uh, of the WTO compatibility and has also made a concrete proposal um, how to secure WTO compatibility and he's not the only one. So I think 
Um, this is something um, that could be ensured uh, to make the proposal WTO compatible. Um, that's more a technical um, discussion, I think, um, that, that, that can be solved. Yeah? And, and again, I think it's, it's, really, it's really important uh, to keep in mind that this is something that's no active attack on some other parts of the world, but it's kind of a defense measure um, that actually Europe needs if it really wants to um, and wants to keep and also to scale up. I mean, you have to uh, you have to keep in mind. I mean, the current carbon price at the European level is really low. It's about 25, 29 euros per ton carbon emission. This is I mean, this is nothing. If you ask the experts um, about uh, the carbon price that's required yeah, um, to to just to come close um, to the um, to the uh, emission goals, yeah, then we have to talk about 60, 70, 80 euro per ton emissions and 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 an uh, increasing uh, scale, yeah, uh, in in the medium run. So, but this is not feasible, um, and and the competitiveness uh, of the European industry uh, will be endangered uh, if we don't have any mechanism um, to um, to protect. Um, the competitiveness of, of, of Europe's uh, industry. And I think that border carbon adjustment mechanism, however it will be um, designed in detail, I think this is an indispensable measure to complement uh, the ETS. I mean, um, there is a lot of empirical evidence that we really didn't have carbon leakage yet. But I mean, that's not really surprising because at the currently low um, carbon uh, price, um, no significant carbon uh, leakage can be expected, but it will be. Uh, it will have to be expected as soon um, as the price, uh, the carbon price, will be increased um, and will come close to the, those levels that are really required um, to reach uh, the European climate goals. Thanks, uh, Jean Pierre. Would you like to the floor? Yes. Yes, and so thank you. I mean, I, I fully agree with what Margit uh, said on the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. I trust the European Commission will come up with uh, a scheme that is uh, both efficient and also fully compatible with uh, World Trade Organization principle. So, and this is indeed very important to ensure level playing field on the single market and to uh, to actually I mean, to um, to make good on our uh, ambition. I mean, to uh, first, I mean, to be a carbon neutral economy, but also, I mean, to our ambition to contribute to saving the planet from global warming. So this would be a very important element, but it's a tool. It's not necessarily something that, uh, if it works well, I mean, if uh, actually all countries uh, were to adhere to uh, to the to the Paris Agreement and uh, I mean comply, I mean with um, with uh, the, this great ambition, which is to to reduce uh, to reduce. Um, the rise of temperature uh, on the Earth. I mean, then in this case, I mean, probably this carbon bottom adjust adjustment mechanism will not bring any money in the in the European treasuries because I mean, other other countries would be compliant with the same principles as, as ours. But that's for the very long term. So in uh, in the transition, it might certainly bring some money in our in our in our in our treasuries. I mean, as a corrective uh, as a corrective mechanism. Now let me turn briefly on the loan component of uh, next generation EU. I mean, these. Uh, I mean, it's of course up to the member states to design their uh, recovery uh, plans, and I mean, each one of them has uh, to have uh, you know its own decision on how they want to finance uh, their the transition. And uh, but this is an opportunity. I think it's an important opportunity for them. I think at this stage, I mean, it's probably a bit too early. Uh, to, to see, I mean, the, I mean, what would be the final uh, recovery recovery plans? I mean, member states are, I mean, in discussion with the European Commission, so they are in the preparation phase. For me, as far as I understand, I think the loan component is very important because, in fact, uh, it's, uh, I mean, kind of a loan that is no longer, I mean, kind of um, for member states from the standpoint of a member states that uh, these. Um, the borrowing from the union is is uh, is not you know kind of uh, a bond that circulates on the market so it reduces uh, 
the market float of sovereign debt. So it makes it, I mean, actually, I mean, it facilitates market access from my standpoint. There is also, I mean, an advantage in terms of, uh, of pricing for some member states, but it's really up to, to every member state to decide what is in its best interest. As an economist, I will tend to think that um, if member states, you know, uh, don't uh, don't want to, um, I mean, to commit to um, to um, to borrowing from from the union at this stage, because I mean, this program, I mean, the recovery plans are over several years. The best uh, the best way forward would be, I mean, to give them the option to borrow if needed. I mean, from the union for financing the digital and the green transition, for example, or for financing uh, their, their recovery, uh, recovery program, you know, um, to give them the option to decide maybe in one year or two years whether they really, really want to, uh, to draw on this, on this loan facility uh, that is under next generation EU. But here I'm talking as an economist because I think there is an option value of deciding where you want, where, where from you want to, to borrow the, to, to borrow either from the markets or, or from the union. But I think it's, uh, in any case, I mean, it's, uh, it was a good feature of this, uh, of this uh, recovery fund. And uh, I do think that all these elements have uh, significantly contributed to, uh, to tame, let's say, market turbulences that could have occurred during the first phase of the crisis. It has, uh, you know, enhanced uh, confidence in, uh, in the credit worthiness of all European, uh, European uh, countries, actually. And this is the way the market has, has taken, uh, you know, has understood, I mean, this deal. And this is, to my view, very well reflected in the current uh, level of uh, interest rates and spread uh, throughout the European Union. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Francesca, would you like to come in? Otherwise, I have one question from the floor to take. Just, just a very few words, so we have another round of questions. I mean, I, I, I agree with Jean-Pierre Vidal. It's, it's, member countries will have to weigh costs and benefits of taking these loans. On the cost, on the, on the benefits side is, of course, especially for countries like Italy or Spain or other countries, is, of course, uh, some savings in interest on the cost side of taking these loans. There are some conditions on the utilization of these funds, which I repeat are most welcome conditions because they need to be used for the common goal of facilitating, uh, facilitating the uh, digital and ecological transition. And as I mentioned before, there might be some uh, issues with the timing of the uh, of the allocation of this money I mean, if you borrow from markets i mean there is no time limit in when you can use the money so it's, it's of course something that countries which don't have the capacity to spend quickly this money might actually uh, consider when deciding whether to go for markets or for the recovery fund in taking this money but i mean i i agree it's in the end it will be a choice that each member country will have to make uh, weighting all these elements Thanks. Uh, so I had a question, uh, 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 Mr. or Mrs. I don't know, Durai, Durai Rai Ja had asked for the floor. Now I don't see him or her yes. on the. Yes, I, ah, I just have. Yes, however, I just have a question about about the policies. Can I go ahead with that? Please, please do. Yes. Sure. Uh, basically, basically the. Uh, for the sustainable recovery, the governments or the uh, decision-making bodies have to uh, take the decisions about as to uh, how to go about the future things. So my question here is uh, how these kind of um, conferences would influence the policy makers or the decision makers? That's what my question. Okay, thank you. Would anybody from the panel like to? Address this? Yeah, I can, I can take this question. He's the, he's the policymaker. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, it, 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 I mean, the, the answer will be very simple. I mean, academic debate, intellectual debate, I mean, are part of the democratic process in our societies. And so, therefore, I mean, exchange of views, I mean, this is a way, build, I mean, ideas are being built in Europe. I mean, through exchanges like this one. And then at some point, I mean, some of these ideas, I mean, uh, take a life of themselves. I mean, 
are factoring in policy consideration and then at some point something happens, something's changed. And if you look at the whole history of the European Union, you will find that it always starts with intellectuals having ideas and at some point, I mean, these ideas, I mean, are better shaped. They start to have some, let's say, importance in the policy debate. And then other people, the politicians, I mean, policy makers, I mean, they also develop these ideas further and at some point, Come, come up with concrete proposals and then these proposals sometimes that they can fail at this stage or they can, they can be, uh, they are considered agreeable and then it's a further step in, uh, in our policy framework or in our policies. That has always been like that. So it's these kind of debates are, to my view, extremely important and is in the very nature actually also of the democratic debate. Sure. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you for the answer. So, I think what what I'd like to do now is is start to wind up the session as the the, the clock is ticking. Uh, maybe I could go back to the panel. Maybe maybe in reverse order. Um, so what I'd like you to do now is to really think a little bit out of the box and a little bit towards the towards the future. So if I can sum up some of the things we've been discussing, um, um, you know, the, the the fiscal rules and and the economic governance of the European Union have been under discussion for a long time. But I think a lot of people see the events of the last uh, six months or maybe nine months really as a game changer. And that's a bit my question to you. Um, there was talk of a Hamiltonian moment um, in the European Union. Um, do you think we've had a Hamiltonian, so Hamiltonian moment, for those who don't know, the, the, this was the moment when after the, this, um, the war of independence in the uh, in the US the uh, the federal level took over the debts of the of the states of the federal states of the US so you know has there been uh, already a shift of that sort of dimension in Europe or is that are we on the you know a path maybe over a, a year or so of 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 such a big step um which is linked to the question are the measures that we've announced uh that we expect to be taken like new generation the borrowing of three quarters of a trillion is that a temporary step a temporary response or as i think francesco was implying you know is this the the start of something big uh where where some will see this as a slippery slope you no know, to something they don't like <laughs> a european super state or as uh more federally inclined observers will think you know is this finally what what the Europeans should have been doing for the last uh, 20 years, maybe, you know, and we've, we've needed this crisis to uh, uh, to actually move in that direction. So maybe I could ask you to, to put on those slightly longer term spectacles now. Uh, if you agree, I would go maybe in reverse order and start with Francesco and then Margaret and then uh, uh, Jean-Pierre and then, then we'll, we'll close. Thank you. Okay, I will try to be a quick. Uh, in my opinion, the game changer is not, I mean, it's not the pandemics. The game changer has been the global financial crisis, at least for the academic debate. The academic debate has been changed by the global financial crisis. I repeat, we were uh, in a world in which there was very little role for uh, economic policy, and if anything, economic policy needed to be uh, handed to a monetary policy. And so fiscal policy was completely out of the picture. Uh, and, um, and that was true until 2008, 2009. So the game changer from an academic point of view, it's that point. So at, starting from 2010, the profession has been uh, thinking and fighting, of course, I mean, we don't have a consensus uh, that is emerging, has been fighting on the respective role of markets and of uh, uh, the government in stabilizing the economy. And that fight has been giving uh, lots of hints, uh, lots of uh, uh, food for thought to policymakers. Let me add that in Europe, we all mentioned that many times in Europe, that hint given by the academic debate uh, was not actually embedded in policy action. So we went back to the, I mean, I don't want to, to redo the history of all the mistakes we made in handling the Greek crisis and the sovereign debt crisis. But I mean, it remains that the game changer from, a, from an academic point of view was 2008-2009. 2020, so the pandemic, is a game changer for, for the European policymaker uh, community because we didn't see the same mistakes that were made before. So 
we, I, I agree with those who say that the action was quick and efficient. The ECB did what needed to be done almost immediately. The national governments went on spending. The European institution, the Commission, the Council, they do whatever you need. Basically, uh, there was a suspension of the stability pact. There was a suspension of uh, uh, state aid rules. So uh, the policy community in uh, Europe uh, really reacted well to the uh, crisis. It remains to be seen whether that will uh, remain true in the in the uh, future. And on the on the recovery fund, as an uh, as an Hamiltonian moment, I already said it before, answering to another question. I mean, uh, yes and no, in the sense that it's just a just between quotes. It's a very important, uh, I repeat, uh, breakthrough. It's a huge effort from Europe to finance national plans. It's very far deal from what we had with Hamilton with the creation of a U.S. federal budget. But I repeat, uh, if it works and if we manage to make it work, and it, of course it means that it actually succeeds in channeling resources where they should be channeled, and if countries do not waste this opportunity to actually transform their economies, then the very success of the recovery fund might be the basis for a permanent uh, budget uh, for the European Union. Thanks a lot, Francesco. Margaret, would you like to come in? Uh, with your microphone on, Margaret, please. Sorry, put your microphone on. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, I wouldn't see a Hamiltonian uh, moment also. I mean, there, 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 is, there are some remarkable um, <laughs> events and decisions going on. Um, and in some respects, um, uh, things appear to be possible uh, that weren't kind of unthinkable like, like nine or ten months ago. Uh, but still, I mean, in many respects, we remain inside the box. Yeah, um, to 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 use your uh, your uh, picture again, uh, we have temporary responses and solutions. Um, and particularly, if you look at the innovative own resources. Uh, discussion. I mean, this is this is very example. This is an example for remaining inside the box. I think. I mean, yes, we are talking about innovative own resources, uh, but this is not new. Um, we are talking about more options and additional options, but still, I mean, they remain within the existing legal and institutional uh, framework, and and yeah, we have still some even years of this debate ahead, um, as it seems now, before something really groundbreaking happens. I mean, the plastic-based own resource, I think that's a good first step, but it's a minor, it's a minor step, yeah. Um, um, obviously, it takes crisis to make progress to its integration at the EU level. I mean, this has become obvious once more after the financial uh, crisis, but still, it's more an ev evolutionary uh, progress. Um, I think it's remarkable that we often hear at the moment that we have to avoid the, uh, the mistakes that were made during the during and after the financial crisis. Let's see um, if that um, will be if these efforts to avoid these uh, mistakes will be uh, successful. So, uh, it's an evolutionary process. Yeah, A European integration is nothing that um, happens in large steps. Uh, or so, but it's it's more an evolution. But I think it's it's going into the right uh, direction. Let's see what happens next. Thank, thank you, Margaret. So please, uh, Tomia Vidal, you have the the final final word. Thank you very much. I mean, I will be very brief. I concur very much with what, uh, in particular, Francesco has said. I mean, I don't know whether it's a Miltonian moment or whatsoever. I don't like this kind of characterization because I do believe that, I mean, the way we build the union in Europe, it's our own way. I mean, we are not copying the U.S. on this. I mean, we are building it our own way. We are, I mean, 20, 27 uh, sovereign member states. I mean, speaking, I think, 24 languages. 
and we make it, in fact, and that's what is important. We certainly, I mean, have institutions that are not perfect, I mean, because they're still under development, as this part of a discussion, it would be part of the discussion in the context of the conference on the future of Europe. But this time, what happened, and I think this is quite remarkable, there was a challenge, there was a crisis. And then a policy response had to be found, had to be designed. And what Europe has shown that in spite, I mean, of the limitation of our institutional framework, and for instance, I mean, the fact that you need unanimity for many decisions in Europe, what the European leaders have shown, also it uh, requires, I mean, from the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, some boldness in, let's say, locking, in a sense, I mean, the, all the leaders are in Brussels for four days to, to discuss, uh, to discuss the recovery package and, and the European budget. What we have shown is that when we are united, in Europe, I mean, we, we are strong, in fact, and we, we can make it, we can make a difference. And this is what we have shown. And in this sense, I think this is this game changer. The game changer is to demonstrate that in spite of what we are, in spite of um, the country framework that we have, that is imperfect, we know how to handle it. Of course, I mean, it has to be handled at the leader's level because, I mean, you have to, in a sense, uh, design, I mean, solutions that are quite quite creative, I would say, or very creative even, and so you are a bit at the border always of what is doable, not doable, so you need the leaders behind behind the solution, but when the leaders are behind the solution, when they are united, I mean, Europe uh, makes a difference. So, in fact, I think uh, they made it, and that's, that's a real game changer for this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a great way to end the session. I think thank, thank you, uh, Pierre Fidal, uh, Margaret Schatzensteller, Francesco Saino. Thanks to people also in the in the background. We've on the technical side where I think it was a was a success. The the the, the first session. Thank you to those following uh, as attendees and on the live stream. Uh, so I'll close this uh, first session now. I thought that it was very interesting. In half an hour. We have a second uh, session with the title Theories of Inflation, Do Central Banks Control the Price Level? So I encourage you to maybe take a take a break, get some fresh air, a cup of coffee or a beer maybe, and, uh, and come back for the second session. So thank you all very much. <laughs>